usually I was driving to the lessons. And that I had done that that same week. I had taken a long drive with them, and I didn't want to do it again if I didn't have to. So, okay, let's let Wallace drive. And, of course, Linda was sitting next to him. She has a driver's license. And it was just I a normal we day. We, we uh, packed the instruments in the car and, and headed up there. And for, for anybody to expect something like that to happen would be insane. It's a day I don't want to remember. It's... Uh... It was just, I, to this day, I can see everything in vivid color. I taught him how to drive, and I'm a very tough teacher. I taught him things he'd never learn in driving school. But we sent him to driving school, too. He was a good driver. The one thing I never taught him was that you could go to sleep, and you shouldn't do that. It was, it was the fault of the weather. It was the fault of the conditions. It was the fault of the tree that was sitting in the field. It was the fault of where it happened to hit one field, and it hit right on her side. When Dad and I went out to Burger King, came home and opened the garage door, is, uh, you know, there's no car in there. My dad goes, this is strange. They're not home. And I said, oh, they'll be home, you know, a little six. It was a horror story. She was trapped in the car, and she was terribly injured leading to death internally, still in control of her mental facilities. And Wallace was terribly injured. He jumped out. I came up to her before I left the car. That was, this was the last time I saw her. Um, and I, I pulled her head back, and I looked in her into the eyes, and, and I just, she was alive still, but I just, I didn't see, see anything. They called and told us about the death of my mother, like about 30 minutes later. And my dad was in tears. He was throwing things around. I mean, he, he, he was out of control. And the only thing I could... He said, uh, I did everything I could. And then I realized he'd lo we lost her. And it was really a terrible hard punch. It was just something that knocked the wind out of me. So my best friend uh, was notified, and he came over and picked me up to see, to collect the children. I put Wally in the car, and we made our trip to two hospitals, the one in Sylvania, I think that was Flower, where Alexander and Jason were. And they were banged up, but they were okay. And he had to go into a room and tell them that their mother was dead, and he, he took care of that. And then we went over to the uh, Toledo Hospital, where Wallace Jr. was, and he was banged up pretty bad. His head was cut pretty in a nasty way. And uh, he knew that his mother uh, was dead uh, when we got there. And we spent about an hour there until he was w felt strong enough to, uh, to get up in the night. I brought the three boys and Wally back home. And, of course, it was a very, very bad snowstorm with the wind blowing, howling. It just seemed like everything had just gone to hell, <laughs> you know. There was a certain, people weren't talking very much in the car, and, and I remember R.D. Matthew is the one that was driving, he drove us home, and he'd comment on the weather now and then, and uh, we consider ourselves pretty lucky that, that uh, we all didn't, <laughs> didn't bite it. <laughs> About five minutes before the car crashed, um, it was quiet in the car, and uh, she took the time out, and she, she just said to each person, um, I love you, Jason. I love you, Alex. And, you know, she'd always wait for the response, I love you too, Mom. I love you, Wallace. I love you too, Mom. And, you know, I love you, Jason. Love you too, man. That was the last, those were the last words she ever said to me. I regret terribly the loss of our mother and wife. But I rejoice singularly that if anybody had to be killed, it was not one of the boys.
And that isn't to say that I didn't love her as much as the boys. I love her in a different way. And she had all those years. They didn't have many years at all. Linda DePew was fatally injured in a single car accident while traveling with her three oldest sons to Ann Arbor, Michigan for violin lessons. And for a moment, the music stopped. And even though the judge can be hard on himself and unshakable in court... A week later, the family received an invitation to appear on the Christian Broadcast Network's 700 Club. I felt like saying, hell no. I don't want to be on your 700 Club. I don't want to be on Frank Sinatra's International Gala. I don't want to be on anything. That was my reaction. And then I turned to the kids and I said, I have to tell you what this is. You tell me what you want to do. You want to be on the 700 Club? National television? They all looked at each other. One of them said, yeah, Dad, Mom would like that. All of them agreed, so we accepted. We knew at some point we would have to get over this and and go on with our lives. I guess we all thought the sooner the better. Even if tomorrow my, all my brothers suddenly died, I think the only thing that would be that I could do is go to my violin and just practice and just work. You can't just quit. You can never quit. You don't feel the shock until um, actually the funeral's over and everything. It's coming home after school and nobody's there to see you or nobody's there. Mom's not there practicing the piano. And uh, it was very empty. Dad was at work and we come home to an empty house. And uh, yeah, it's, you know, the shock doesn't set in until actually the regular life goes on. And that's when it hits you, and that's and it tore me up for quite a while. But. Wallace became suicidal, and my dear friend Jerry Rose, the great concert pianist, said, "You've got to get him away from you. You have to get him out of here." Well, I was financially distraught. I didn't have any way to send him anywhere, and Jerry got him a scholarship at Aspen, arranged it all, and sent him. And I talked to some uh, older musicians, you know, in their 50s, 60s, and they say, well, sometimes uh, tragedies in life um, cause a, a deeper sensitivity for music and everything. But I say, well, how can I use this as an excuse to make me play better? I, you know, that, that's not what I want to think about at all. Wallace would call me and say, I'm coming home, Dad. I can't stand it out here. And, you know, just depressed, depressed, depressed. No, you're there for the duration, son. You're going to stay there until you accomplish something. Now, I'm not rushing you, and I'm not telling you what to do. You just get up every day and do the best you can do. And as soon as you can, put the violin in your hand and go to work. I was, uh, I just was not alive practically at all. I was just, I was a zombie. And I guess he caught me one evening when I was so sick of it, I'd hear the phone ring and every time the phone would ring my blood would run cold because I wouldn't know what had happened. And I went over and I'm gonna kill myself and I said, okay, go ahead and do it. Quit talking about it and do it. But you're not coming home unless you come home feet first in a box. Now make up your mind, but do this for me. Don't call me anymore. I don't want to hear from you. You're out there where you've got beautiful flowers all over the mountains. Beautiful, perfect 
crystalline streams running everywhere. You've got friends who have an interest in you, and all you can talk about is killing yourself. I want to hear from you when you see the flowers, when you have a good time with the friends, when you play some music and you touch somebody's heart. Then call me, but don't call me before that. And I hung up. Now every time the phone rang, I didn't know what to expect. It was terrorizing me. I didn't think I could stand it anymore. And the next time I heard Wallace's voice, he said, Dan, I'm playing the violin. Oh, I've heard beautiful symphonies, but I never heard anything that was as musical and as good as that. That was the greatest single line of English I've ever heard in my life. And it just goes to show the kind of guts that boy has. He was picking it up again, coming up off the floor to win. And that's my kind of man.